By the late 60s BCE, the former followers of Sulla had settled on a strategy of political obstructionism. The optimates, as they called themselves, had turned obstruction into something of an art form, successfully denying Pompey of the settlements he needed in order to add to the territorial holdings of the Republic. They also denied him the funds he needed in order to settle his veterans. In desperation, Pompey would team with Caesar and his old rival Crassus to form a rival political bloc. The first triumvirate did not bring Rome's problems to an end, and eventually ended when Pompey cast in his lot with the Optimates. Caesar prevailed in the Civil War, becoming Rome's preeminent man with dictatorial powers, but he provided no solutions to Rome's problems before his opponents tried to fix Rome by murdering him. Perforating Caesar with daggers also didn't solve Rome's problems, as his heirs rallied his old legions for another civil war. In the end, the second triumvirate was no more stable than the first, resulting in a final showdown between Mark Antony and Octavian. Octavian, Caesar's grandnephew, emerged victorious. Unlike the would-be reformers before him, Octavian's ideas for reform extended beyond merely murdering his political opponents, although he did do plenty of that, leading him to quietly enact the reforms which transformed the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. Late in the year 60, three Roman politicians came together at the city of Lucca to forge a political alliance which would forever transform the face of Roman politics. These three men were Gaius Julius Caesar, Gnaeus Pompey the Great, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. Each one of them brought something different to the table, and each one of them expected to get certain rewards in return. Julius Caesar was the junior of this trio, and he was the man who was about to run for consul. He needed the support, financial and otherwise, of Pompey and Crassus to get elected. Caesar was himself the heir to the popularist tradition, being the nephew by adoption of Gaius Marius. As for Marcus Crassus, he is somewhat of the poster boy for ambition thwarted. He was not a big fan of Pompey up to this point, and he also was on the bad side of the Optimates. His only real achievement at this stage in his life was being the richest man in Rome, largely due to inheritance, and putting down the revolt of Spartacus in 71. Aside from that, however, he had not really had all that many opportunities to distinguish himself in the way that he wanted. There was also Pompey the Great, a man who had been a superstar in Roman politics for his entire adult life. He was still shocked and chagrined that the Senate would not confirm his settlements in the East. And so he was looking for allies who would help him carry his legislation through so he could retire in dignity. Together, these three would form the first triumvirate, and they would be largely unstoppable for the next decade. As consul the next year in 59, Caesar's job was to make sure that Pompey's eastern arrangements were ratified and that his veterans were given the land that they had been promised. Pompey had had his best friend as consul the year before, Afranius, and Afranius had failed to deliver. Caesar, however, was made of tougher stuff, and he would do whatever was necessary to get those pieces of legislation passed. Pompey and Crassus, for their part, agreed that when it came time for Caesar to get a command after his consulship, a proconsular command as it was called, that he would get one that was important and would give him lots of latitude to win a claim. And so, they went to work for Caesar behind the scenes with their many allies in the Senate and with the people. The Triumvirate also recruited a number of more junior members to work as tribunes and in other capacities to make sure that the Triumvirate prospered. Of course, all the men who signed on as junior associates also got theirs. So the men who signed up to be followers of the Triumvirs would typically achieve high offices themselves, although most of them were still fairly junior in the early years, so they wouldn't start to rise to the higher offices until the 50s were about to draw to a close. Going into 59, Julius Caesar went before the Senate and tried once again to pass the legislation that Pompey needed, that is, the ratification of his agreements in the East and money to settle his veterans on land in Italy. 
Once again, under the leadership of the obstructionist Optimates, the Senate refused to cooperate. Unlike previous consuls and other people on Pompey's side, Caesar refused to buckle to this obstructionism, and some of the men who followed the triumvirate actually began to threaten Bibulus's life. Bibulus was scared for his life, but he was not completely witless. So while he did stay home, he did something that would later provide him with ammunition to use against Caesar. Bibulus stayed home and said that he was looking for signs, that he was looking for omens. So what he was implying is that he thought that the gods did not approve of what was happening, and that, therefore, everything that was going on was illegal. This would be something that Bibulus and the Optimates would hang their hats on for the next decade and use as a bludgeon against Julius Caesar. This would also be what they try to prosecute him on for literally the next decade. Because Bibulus was not in the Senate House when legislation was being passed at a near record rate, the joke at the time was that 59 was the year of the consuls Julius and Caesar. Caesar and his allies passed basically everything they put forward, and Bibulus, for his part, was at home trying to find signs from the gods. Caesar was, in a certain sense, the most successful consul of that era, but at the same time, he got where he was due to threats and violence, and this made him no shortage of enemies. Of all the triumvirs, it is safe to say that Julius Caesar quickly became the most hated and remained the most hated for the duration of the first triumvirate. And it is precisely because of the so-called gangster government in the consulship of Julius and Caesar in the year 59. Caesar was appointed proconsul as soon as his consulship ended, and he was assigned to be the governor of Cisalpine Gaul, which is in northern Italy. He also managed to pick up Transalpine Gaul, which is southern France. Between these two commands, he had a number of legions, and he was also bordering the Gauls, who were an ancestral enemy of Rome. Caesar decided to take the opportunity to go to war with one of Rome's oldest enemies, and that's exactly what he did. He started a war with them, and even in his own account, his justification for going to war is paper thin. No pun intended, because you'd have to read the book. Um, but anyhow, he went on a war that enabled him to conquer all of Gaul in the course of about a decade. Over the course of this war, he managed to do two major feats which became legendary. One is that he landed in Britain twice. Up to this point, there were people who still believed that Britain might be fictional, that it wasn't a real place. But Caesar landed twice, and in one of his operations, he actually landed under enemy fire and had to disembark while being shot at. So basically, he did the Roman equivalent of D-Day. Another thing that he pulled off during this Gallic War was he actually built a bridge across the Rhine and entered Germany for the first time. Caesar had to both first conquer Gaul and then put down a massive revolt, which resulted in some huge battles, all of which he was able to win, at least the ones that counted. He managed to amass a major army to do this. At one point, he had up to ten legions. By the time the war was over, he still had eight. In his own words, in his history of the Gallic War, Caesar claims that he killed one-third of the population, enslaved another third, and left the final third in Gaul to be subjects of Rome. So Caesar, by his own admission, is committed what would be called in modern terms a mass-scale genocide. It's also worth mentioning that Caesar's command in Gaul was extended for a record length of time. Never before had any Roman commander held a decade-long command. His command was about nine years, from 58 to 49. This was even longer than the command that Lucullus held in the Mithridatic War. His legions, because of Caesar's success and because of their long exposure to this charismatic leader, the legions became fanatically loyal to Caesar, to a degree that even Sola would envy. And of course, this would become a bit of a problem if, say, you wanted to threaten Caesar at some point, as someone is actually stupid enough to do a little later on. One thing that many elite Romans took away from Caesar's treatment of Bibulus is that violence and intimidation work wonderfully. Accordingly, each side decided to start their own political gang, 
and each side appointed a senator to lead that gang. The Optimates had a gang under Titus Onius Milo. Milo had a gang that included many former gladiators. On the triumvirate side, the leader was Publius Clodius Pulcher, a man so dedicated to the cause of the triumvirate at first that in order to be one of their tribunes, he actually renounced his patrician heritage and became adopted by a plebeian family. Clodius was a bit of a wild card. His relationship with the triumvirate would be deeply strained on many occasions, but ultimately he was more their guy than a creature of the Optimates. And by the way, while patrician bloodlines were no longer nearly as valued in the late Republic as they'd been earlier, it was still almost unthinkable for someone to renounce basically their noble heritage. So Clodius is a man who really sticks out in this era as being exceptionally ruthless and dedicated. The two sides, including Clodius and Milo, often took the other to court and would use trumped-up charges. Most of the people who got convicted were fairly low-level guys on either side, while the big fish typically managed to escape. But the point is that there were political trials all the time, and a lot of those trials were the result of violence committed in street battles. In this general atmosphere of chaos and violence, Julius Caesar was emerging as a household hero for most Romans. He published his Gallic War commentaries every single year, so he had mentioned all the great battles he had won, his journeys to Britain and uh, Germany, and he also talked about all of the Gauls he was defeating on behalf of Rome. So he was becoming this legendary hero at a time when Pompey the Great was already a great hero. So if you're Crassus, you're beginning to become worried about your position in the triumvirate. Crassus does not have the great achievements of his fellow triumvirs. And so he begins to organize a great campaign in the East. The only problem, of course, is that Crassus is not a good enough general to lead something like that. But because he has both the political allies and the wealth to make something like that happen, it happens anyway. In 53, Crassus led a large Roman army against the Parthian Empire. This army was high quality. However, like most Roman armies, it was primarily an infantry army. The difficulty was that Crassus was attempting to cross a major open area for hundreds of miles against an enemy that was almost all cavalry, and employed a lot of archery. The Romans did have some horsemen, but not nearly as many, and they weren't nearly as good. So effectively, you have an enemy that you can't really catch or shoot at, and that enemy can strike you at will. Crassus put up a valiant effort, but ultimately, he lost. The campaign was poorly conceived, Crassus himself, while brave, was not really much of a general, and he vastly underestimated the capacity of the Parthian cavalry. And this ended up costing him his life, along with the lives of many, many Roman legionaries. The defeat at Carai was one of the worst that Rome would suffer, and it was something that the Romans would spend about 20 years trying to find various ways to avenge. Not long after Rome received news of Crassus's catastrophe at Carai, it learned of a scuffle between Milo and Clodius on the outskirts of town which resulted in the death of Clodius. The two men ran into each other on the outskirts of town, each one of them had their own little following, and at first they tried to avoid battle with one another, but some of their hangers-on got into it, it developed into a general scuffle, and Clodius was badly wounded. Clodius's men hauled him off to an inn to heal, but Milo figured that if he let Clodius survive and heal up, that this would lead to further fighting and that Clodius would seek revenge, so he decided to just follow him up, invade the inn, and kill him. He thought this would end all of their problems forever and that Clodius's gang would be done for. However, what Milo didn't count on is that Clodius was extremely popular with the common people of Rome. And so, when Clodius's widow and a couple of his allies gave a funeral oration for Clodius, and they asked the people of Rome to make the Senate House his funeral pyre, 
the people cheered and used force to make this happen. The senators were forced to abandon the place where they had deliberated and passed laws for decades, and it was used as a funeral pyre for Clodius. It's almost impossible to think of a more badass funeral. So this goes to show you exactly just how influential and charismatic Clodius truly was. Later in the year 52, there was still a great deal of anger at Milo for Clodius' death, and he lost a lot of his popularity, because up to that point he actually was relatively popular as well. It might seem odd that two rival gang leaders would equally be popular, but Rome was a strange place and people were looking for solutions in all the weirdest possible places. Um, anyway, later in 52, despite being defended by many of the top men in Rome, including Rome's greatest orator and lawyer Cicero and Pompey himself, Milo was convicted and exiled for his role in Clodius' death. So at least in 52, Rome was more or less delivered of the major gang leaders. However, even with them being gone, Rome's problems persisted. The first triumvirate was always based on the relationship between Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. Once that relationship began to break down, so did the first triumvirate. The first blow fell in 54. That year, Julia died. Julia was Caesar's daughter and Pompey's wife. She had married Pompey when the first triumvirate was formed, and that was the primary bond between Caesar and Pompey. Despite the massive age gap between Julia and Pompey, they seemed to have been happy, and Pompey was greatly aggrieved, as was Caesar. For Caesar, it was his only child, by the way. And Caesar tried to arrange for Pompey to marry one of his other female relatives, but Pompey said that he was too deep in grief to do something like that. So they let it be for the time. And so that relationship would gradually start to drift apart as now Caesar and Pompey had one less thing connecting them. In 53, of course, Crassus died, and his death very much destabilized the triumvirate. Not only did it deprive it of one of its members, and one of the members who made it definitionally a triumvirate, but it also re removed a buffer between Caesar and Pompey, the two biggest members of the triumvirate at this point. So without Crassus there as a balancing force, it could become a rivalry between two men. The turmoil of 53 and 52, as Milo and Clodius battled and Clodius lost his life and the Senate house got burned, led to the Optimates looking for a strong leader. For all of their bluster about being the best men, they really didn't have one. And so they had to turn to Pompey in order to find a leader who could keep order and make sure that the elections for the next year went smoothly. So Pompey took over as sole consul, kept order, and Rome continued to chug along. Well, it continued to move along. I don't know if chug is quite the right word here since it wasn't going that well. But at any rate, Pompey had won some of the admiration of the Optimates, and the Optimates were starting to win him over as well. Not long after this, despite still being grief-stricken, Pompey decided to get married again. But this time, the woman he married was the daughter of Metellus Scipio. And have no doubt about it, despite all of the valorization of Cato the Younger in a lot of the sources, the leader of the Optimates was not Cato the Younger, it was Metellus Scipio. Metellus Scipio had all the best bloodlines in Rome in his veins, and he was adopted by one of the top families in Rome, as well. This means that in a, in a political faction that was really obsessed with rank and nobility, that Metellus Scipio had the most impeccable record of them all, and because of his inheritance, he was also magnificently rich. So he was the leader of the Optimates, not Cato the Younger, who was never consul. And also, by the way, as we'll see, a few examples of this play out. Uh, Metellus Scipio, so far as we can tell, is a man who literally didn't have two brain cells rubbed together. This man was completely moronic. If he took an IQ test, the results would come back negative. And yet, he is going to be in a major position of influence and authority for the rest of his life. And he will be the guy who is the most 
influential with Pompey by virtue of being his father-in-law. So this will be a major factor as to why the Optimates ultimately fail. Caesar and Pompey continued to drift apart. Caesar wanted to know what Pompey was up to. Why is he getting in bed with Metellus Scipio's daughter? Doesn't he know that this woman can't possibly have a very high intellectual ability since, you know, she's the daughter of Metellus Scipio? Well, maybe Pompey just liked him a little on the dumb side. We don't know. But at any rate, what happened is that Pompey and Caesar are drifting away from each other and the Optimates are slowly but steadily eroding that bond and making Pompey their guy. By about the year 50, the last of the Gallic resistance had petered out, and Caesar had largely finished the Gallic War. He still had eight legions in Gaul, at a time when Pompey had two or three in Spain, and none in Italy. So, effectively, if you're going to enter into negotiations and you are not Caesar, you have to keep in mind that Caesar does have the possibility of employing military force in a way that you cannot. That's something that Pompey probably understood, or at least should have, but there was someone in his ear who was far too stupid to think of something like that, and I'm of course referring to his father-in-law, Metellus Scipio. And because of Metellus Scipio's influence and his insistence, the Senate ended up issuing issuing an ultimatum for Caesar to stand down and report to Rome for a trial over his consulship in 59. So you might point out Caesar has eight fanatically loyal legions. And Metellus Scipio would respond, but we have some minor technicalities. We win. The Senate actually wanted Caesar to come back and face trial before doing anything else. Caesar's position was that he wanted to come home serve as consul again, and then go east to avenge the loss to Parthia. Caesar, by this point in his life, thought that his life was coming to an end soon. He didn't know how many years he had left. But he had kind of given up on domestic politics to a large extent. Caesar had found his true calling. He wanted to be a conqueror. Earlier in his life, before forming the First Triumvirate, he apparently saw a statue of Alexander the Great and wept because he reflected that he was already older than Alexander was when he died, and Alexander had conquered the whole world, whereas he had done so little. So Caesar, at this point, is just obsessed with winning military accolades, doesn't really care about anything else, and rather than recognizing that and then letting Caesar go loose in the east, where they could get rid of him once and for all, the Optimates, under the brilliant leadership of Metellus Scipio, decided, no, you're going to face trial, we're sticking with the letter of the law. Well, guess what? Caesar decided that it would be a better option to cross the Rubicon. The Rubicon was a small river, really more of a stream, separating his province from the rest of Italy. And by crossing it, he effectively became an outlaw and declared war on Rome. Now, not surprisingly, given that Caesar had troops and Pompey didn't, Pompey and his followers fled east to Greece, and Caesar took Rome and declared himself dictator. Now they were in a full state of civil war. Each side declared the other to be outlaws, and the fight was on. After dealing with Pompey's legions in Spain, Caesar then invaded Greece in the year 48. Once he landed, he found himself besieged at Dyrrhachium. He nearly lost there. He barely escaped and made it to the town of Pharsalus in Thessaly. At this point, he was once again trapped, and he was outnumbered two to one. The campaign and the war with it was effectively completely over. Pompey just had to wait, and Caesar's men would eventually go hungry and be forced to surrender. But then there were some idiots in camp, including Metellus Scipio and Cicero, neither of whom knew the first thing about anything remotely military, who told Pompey that if he were a true Roman and a true man, that he would fight Caesar in the open in a field battle and crush him in the way that Rome crushed its enemies. Pompey at first resisted this advice because he knew it was stupid. Caesar's men, although outnumbered, were hardcore veterans of the Gallic War. These were guys who were capable of winning in desperate situations, as they had done on many occasions. 
So the only way Caesar had a chance is in a field battle. And that's exactly what Pompey was baited into giving him. So they fought the field battle at Pharsalus, and despite being massively outnumbered, Caesar won. And now Pompey has to flee, and he gets to Egypt. When he tries to meet with King Ptolemy, the king has him beheaded and then presents his head to Caesar as a gift. Caesar's pretty horrified by this because... Again, Pompey had been his former son-in-law, and he thought that it was absolutely abominable that someone would kill a Roman if they themselves were not Roman. Caesar decides to stay in Alexandria for a little bit. He meets Ptolemy's sister-slash-wife, Cleopatra VII. They begin having a love affair, and as they break out in the Civil War, Caesar and his legion in Egypt end up getting involved. This becomes a fairly protracted affair. Caesar helps Cleopatra defeat her brother, and then he moves on to try to finish off the remainder of the Optimates. When he arrives in Africa, he finds that the army there is large, very well trained and organized, but the commander is Metellus Scipio. And so, he obviously wins that battle, and then he goes to Spain. Here, there were a lot of hardened veterans for the Senate, and Caesar's former number two man in Gaul, the man who knew him best. So Caesar fought his last and hardest fought battle at Munda in 45 and managed to prevail there. Caesar had declared himself dictator at the outset of this conflict, and while it had been Sulla's practice to kill his opponents, Caesar decided to use what he called clementia, or clemency. Usually in English we just call it mercy. So he would pardon people and send them home. He wanted to be the opposite of Sulla. Sulla had been dictator when Caesar was a teenager, and Caesar had made his whole career basically denouncing Sulla. So Caesar thought that he was winning over supporters by granting them clementia, but instead he was actually coming across to them as condescending rather than generous. In Roman society, if you pardon someone, or you grant them some forgiveness, this implies that you are their master and they are your slave. Because otherwise, you should not be in a position to give them this forgiveness. So, basically what Caesar did is alienate all the people he thought he was trying to make into friends. And they really took this insult to heart and began to plot with all of his enemies either dead or defeated, Caesar was now in the same position that Sulla had occupied some 40 years earlier. As dictator, he had the ability to legislate Rome's problems away, in theory, but in practice, he didn't quite know how. Caesar was an efficient dictator. He cashiered the legions he no longer needed and made sure that they were content with their lots in life so they wouldn't rise up or cause problems. And he also tried to conduct governmental business as efficiently as he could. Among the reforms that he made at this time were some reforms of a fairly technocratic character. The best known of which is the creation of the Julian calendar. Up to this time, Rome's calendar had been an absolute mess. It had been based on both the sun and the moon. And priests had had to add random months in to make sure that the names of the month corresponded with the part of the year that we were actually in. So Caesar fixes that. And in fact, the Julian calendar is more or less the same calendar we still use today. There were only a handful of small fixes made by Pope Gregory in the Middle Ages. So this was a major reform, and it was important, but it didn't get to the heart of the matter. Caesar was not all that interested in finding deep political solutions, however, because, once again, he felt that he was nearing the end of his life, and he wanted to make sure that he spent most of his remaining energy trying to conquer Parthia. So he wanted to avenge Crassus and win greater glory than any Roman ever before by being the most like Alexander. When it comes to what he thought would happen in Rome after he died, Caesar doesn't really seem to have cared all that much if we're being completely honest about it. It seems that he embraced that old chestnut that had fueled so many Romans before him that 
ultimately things would just kind of straighten themselves out. Things would just kind of work out at some point. People would figure it out. But for him, destiny called, and his destiny was off in the East. He also thought that he had done a good enough job and that he had been generous enough to the men he had pardoned that they had no reason to hold a grudge against him. They knew he was about to go East, so they would leave him alone. And accordingly, he actually dismissed most of his bodyguards and just allowed himself to be exposed to all of these men in public without any guards around. He figured that there was no danger. Why would they kill him now? All he's going to do is go enlarge the Republic in the East. What's objectionable about that? Caesar committed two major mistakes when it came to dealing with his defeated rivals. One was assuming that they understood Clementia to be Caesar's gift to them rather than some sort of insult. The second misunderstanding is that he assumed that they were much more intelligent and perceptive than they actually were. Caesar seems to have figured out that merely killing your opponents does not end Rome's problems. Plenty of people had tried that already, and it hadn't worked. Sulla had killed pretty much all the popularities, and yet Caesar himself, as basically the last man standing, was able to revive that faction. Simple political murder got you nowhere. Well, Caesar should have had that conversation with the men who assassinated him, because on the Ides of March, that is to say March the 15th, 44 BCE, about a month or so before Caesar was slated to leave for the East, he held an audience in the theater of Pompey, which is now where the Senate met, because again, the Senate house had been destroyed by Clodius' funeral, and Caesar was sitting in a chair receiving petitioners. Some of the men he had pardoned from the Civil War approached him, and he thought nothing of it. When they crowded around him, he figured that they just had a proposal that they all felt was important. And then they all pull out their knives and start stabbing him. Caesar died on the stage in front of the people, and this, of course, would lead to continued chaos. Unfortunately, the men who killed him assumed that all you got to do is kill the tyrant and the tyranny is over. All you got to do is kill your opponents and then everything will just go back to normal and everything will be great again. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. Caesar was dead, but the men who had followed him in the battle, his legions, were still alive. And Caesar's generals were still alive. So, this failed miserably. And Caesar's former commanders, men such as Mark Antony, and Caesar's grand nephew and the heir to his estate, a man named Octavian, started to scramble in order to get Caesar's legions organized. The assassins were horrified at their own stupidity, and had to flee east to Greece in order to try to raise up men and defend themselves in case the Caesarians, as they were now called, were to come after them. The events of the year or so after Caesar's assassination are perhaps some of the most chaotic and confusing in the entirety of Roman history. I'm not going to try to untangle all of the details and people involved. What I will simply tell you is that when that year came to a close, the world was now divided between the Second Triumvirate in the West and the Assassins in the East. And this would set up the Battles of 42. In the West, the Second Triumvirate that formed consisted of two of Caesar's old generals, Mark Antony and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, and Caesar's heir, Octavian. Octavian legally was adopted by Caesar posthumously, and so the 19-year-old was now Gaius Julius Caesar and one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in all of Rome. In the year 42, Octavian and Antony led their forces into Greece to confront Brutus and Cassius, the two most prominent of the assassins. They defeated them at the Battle of Philippi and then proceeded to divide the world between the members of the Second Triumvirate. Rather than ruling together in Rome, they decided to spread their legions around, and rule different parts of the Roman world. Lepidus basically ruled Sicily, Africa, and some areas in the southwest. Octavian ruled Italy and Gaul, and I think Spain as well. And then Antony had the entire east. So Antony got the lion's share, but that made sense because he was the most accomplished of this group. He was, up to this point, the most proven commander, 
and he also had been Caesar's master of horse, or sort of co-dictator in a sense. Not co-dictator, maybe like assistant dictator is the best way to phrase that. So Antony had been Caesar's right-hand man for a while, and was the best position to handle the work. However, uh, the first triumvirate would prove to be not much more successful than the first at staying together. And this was really exacerbated by the fact that each of the triumvirs lived in a different place. In the west, Octavian managed to defeat and capture Lepidus. He actually pardoned Lepidus, and Lepidus would continue to live in Rome for the rest of his life. In the east, Antony launched a major invasion of Parthia to try to avenge the defeat of Crassus, but he lost. And this greatly diminished both his power and his prestige thus leaving an opening for Octavian. Much like the first triumvirate, the second triumvirate was sealed in part by marriage alliances between the chief members. The most notable marriage alliance made was between Mark Antony and Octavian's sister Octavia. However, after Antony met Queen Cleopatra VII and fell in love with her, he decided to divorce Octavia in order to marry Cleopatra. He had a few kids by Cleopatra, and it looked like he was on the verge of potentially leaving his holdings to his children. Well, Octavian, who was one of the greatest propagandists to ever live, decided to take full advantage of this. He portrayed Antony as being the kind of guy who was completely abandoning all things Roman and really just throwing away everything that Rome had worked for throughout its history. He also played very effectively to anti-Eastern prejudices. So when he was recruiting men to go fight Antony, he portrayed Antony as someone who had gone native and betrayed everything that they held sacred. And so Octavian's men were deeply fired up to go get Mark Antony. At the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE, Octavian's fleet met and completely destroyed the fleet of Antony and Cleopatra on the west coast of Greece. With this defeat, their military power was completely shattered. Antony's remaining legions were stranded in Greece and forced to surrender. Many of his other legions had been smashed up in his eastern wars. So Octavian, in one battle, had effectively destroyed Mark Antony. Octavian then pursued the pair to Egypt, where they committed suicide, and he was left as the master of Egypt. A few years later, after he had returned home, Octavian attended a meeting of the Senate where they voted him a new honorific name. That name is Augustus, meaning the revered one. Augustus now had full power, but unlike his great uncle, he did have a lot of ideas for how to resolve the political problems of the Republic. However, his ideas are complex enough that they deserve their own lecture, and so I will end this here. With Octavian's triumph and his becoming Augustus, the Republic died. But a new order, the Roman Empire, was born.